Hi, I'm Rowan from Vantage Admissions. In this video, we're going to work through a Cambridge Maths interview question to do with showing that certain types of numbers share no common factors. If you're interested in more interview questions or broader support with your interview preparation, do remember to subscribe and to visit our website. So we're considering the expressions 2 to the 2 to the n and 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1, each plus 1. And we need to show that these are going to be co-prime when n and m are different numbers from each other. So the term co-prime just means no common factors. If you didn't know the term, the interviewer certainly would not hold it against you and would be happy to give you that definition. So I'd recommend you'll get the most benefit out of this question if you pause the video here and have a go yourself before watching on. Assuming you've now done that and unpaused or have decided to skip having a go yourself today, let's now solve the problem. So the first thing I would say is clearly the two numbers are of the same form, except that one of them uses an n, one of them uses an m. So we might as well give them a name. We might as well think of these as, you know, terms in some sequence, one being the nth term, one being the mth term. It should be useful to have that notation. Now, purely because I happen to know that these are called Fermat numbers, I'm going to call the sequence Fn, F for Fermat, but you don't need to do that. You could use A or X or whatever you like. So let's define Fn as 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. And so what we really want to do is to show that Fn and Fm are co-prime. It's a little bit more compact if we introduce this notation. So really, to make progress, it would be very nice if we could derive some sort of relation that's obeyed between the different f's, between f of one value and f of another value. If we had an equation that somehow related different f's, it would be a little bit easier for us to see, for example, what could be the common factors, and hopefully that is none, uh, between two different f's if f's evaluated at different values of the index. So something like, you know, maybe factorizing this expression could be quite nice, especially considering that we, we do have a, a statement we want to prove about factors, especially if we could factorize it in such a way that the other f started to get involved. So there's not really anything hugely obvious to do, but here's one nice step that we might think to take. Of course, it might take some trial and error to come to this idea. Where it's a plus, there's not really a lot we can do. Although there is a generalized sum of powers factorization, a way of factorizing something to one power plus something to another power, there is a way of factorizing that, but it only works if n is odd. And this power, being a pure power of two, certainly is not odd. So as it stands, there's nothing really that we can do factorization-wise. But if I were to subtract two, from both sides of the defining relation, then we can turn that plus one into a minus one. Now this is extremely friendly because now that I've got something which is clearly identifiable as a square, I mean, I can think of this as being two to the two to the n minus one squared. So I'm using my laws of exponents there, the fact that if I square that, I double the exponent and so I restore my missing power of two. I can see that this is simply a difference of two squares and so should be amenable to a very straightforward factorization. So sometimes we have to be prepared to take slightly brutal steps. The equation might not behave in the form it's given to us and we might need to do something like say subtract a two. Now we'll need to think about what we're gonna do with that two at the end, even if we do succeed with factorizing, but perhaps we can bring it back over to the other side once we finish our factorization games and get something nice. So I don't think the minus two is in itself going to be hugely obstructive. OK, so let's use difference of squares. So I've got that Fn minus two is, so obviously one is one squared. So I get that minus one and that plus one. Now, I like this very much. This term here is amenable to the difference of squares in exactly the same way. It's got the same algebraic structure as what we had before, except the power is shifted. And this is actually nothing other than f of n minus 1. It's of our f form, 
just with the exponent shifted down. So I can write this as f of n minus 1, that's that term, times 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. And now I can iterate the argument. So now if I use difference of squares on that, the plus term is going to be f of n minus 2. And the minus term that remains is going to have the index shifted down one more. Then I can iterate again. So now the plus term is going to supply me an f of n minus 3. And the remaining minus term is now 2 to the 2 to the n minus 3 minus 1. And having done this a few times, we can now see clearly where this process ends. So it's eventually going to end at the point where I drop this exponent all the way down to be, for example, a zero, right? So if I, if I imagine iterating further, I want to go to the point where I've dropped it by n minus n. Now, remember that the thing we subtracted, like n minus one. N minus three was the exponent of the final, was the argument of the final f. N minus two was the argument of the final f. So when I've iterated n times and I've got zero there, the final term I'm going to get is simply f of zero. So that means that in the sort of ultimate conclusion here, I get the product all the way down to f of zero, and then I get this thing over here. Okay, so what is that? This term here, well, two to the zero is one. 2 minus 1 is just 1. So this factor is just 1. We can ignore it. And so overall, we see that fn is equal to, I'm going to write the product, or fn minus 2 rather, is equal to this. And I'm going to write the product the other way, just so that it's going up rather than down, purely for aesthetic reasons. So we've arrived at, you know, exactly the sort of equation that we said we'd quite like. We have a relation which relates fn to other n f's, or to other f's at other values of n, if you like. They're multiplied together, which is a nice thing to have if we're considering divisibility. And I've got this plus two that seems to kind of throw off common factors somehow. It means I've got a remainder, say. Um, so this looks quite promising. Now, reminding ourselves what we actually wanted to prove. We wanted to prove that f of n and f of m share no common factors. So I've got f of n in terms of all the smaller f's. So we can say without loss of generality, without assuming anything, let's assume that m is smaller than n. So the reason I'm doing that is if n is the number that I've got on the left, clearly if m is smaller, then fm is going to appear somewhere in that product, because in that product, I've got all the earlier f's. I say without loss of generality, without affecting the problem, because if instead I had that n was smaller than m, I would just use this factorization to get fm in terms of all the earlier f's, including fn. So I just swap the labels n and m around. It doesn't ruin my argument. I can safely restrict to the case where m is less than n. So what would it mean if I did have a common factor? Well, let's suppose that a divisor, let's say d, goes into fn and fm. I want to try and show that's not possible. So I think, you know, proof by contradiction should be quite natural. Presumably there will be some obvious issue with this. So I've got fn equal to fm times some stuff because I know I've got fm among there. So the stuff is just all the other f's plus two. So it's clear from this equation that if d goes into fn and also into fm, then it has to go into 2 as well. And if you don't like that, if it's not sort of sufficiently obvious, one way we can see that is we can actually make 2 the subject and say, well, look, fn minus fm times some stuff is equal to 2. So if my divisor goes into fn and fm, then d goes into both terms. So if I have a difference of two multiples of d, clearly I get a multiple of d. I can pull the d out. So that means that d goes into two. So we've managed to show that if there is a divisor that's common to fn and fm, it has to also go into two. Well, hang on a minute. That means that the only potential divisor, the non-trivial divisor, because we're not going to count one as an interesting divisor, one goes into anything. The only number other than one that goes into two, because two is prime, is two. 
So the only potential divisor is two. So we're very, very nearly done. We've shown that the only common factor they could possibly have is two. But hang on a minute, let's remember what these things were. They're clearly odd because it's an even number plus one. So that can't be a common divisor either. So this is going to be impossible as the f's are actually odd. So we're done. So quite a challenging problem. We did need to take quite a bold step at the start, subtracting the two off. It's the sort of question where getting started can be really hard. The interviewers will be expecting that they might have to give some gentle hints. They might, for example, suggest difference of squares to you. And really what they'll be looking for is if they do give you a little hint, can you actually pay attention to what they're saying? Can you use their hint to get unstuck? And then once you're unstuck, can you take it from where they left off? Can you carry on and solve the problem yourself? I would say this is one of the more challenging problems which we've seen reported. I hope you found this question interesting. Do let us know in the comments what you'd like to see next. Thanks very much for watching and please remember to like and subscribe.